5.4, we're going to take a look at exponential functions. Okay, we did logarithmic functions. Now we're going to look at exponential functions. Um, in particular, again, looking at differentiation and integration in this section. And we're going to start by looking at the natural exponential function. So the inverse function of y equals ln of x is called the natural exponential function. Okay, that makes sense. The first one was called natural log. So this one's got the name natural, that adjective in there as well, natural exponential function. It's denoted as f inverse of x equals e to the x, or y equals e to the x. So y is going to equal e to the x if and only if x is equal to natural log of y. Okay, so this definition is hinging upon what we just did on inverse functions in the previous section of this chapter. When we started out with f of x equals natural log of x, and we wanted to find inverse, we would go y equals natural log of x, and then we would switch it, and then we would have x equals the natural log of y. Okay, so far so good. In order to solve this equation, we need what are called exponentials. And the way that this works, there's a couple of ways. I'll show it and you can decide which way you like better. One of the ways is to say, I'm going to take an E and make it the base of each side. When I do that, the E, which is, right, this is log base E, we talked about that. The log base and the E cancel, leaving me with Y. And I have Y equals E to the X. That's one option. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not the one I use, but it's, it's nothing wrong with it. The other way that you can think about this, I'm actually going to write this as log base e of uh, y like this. And I'm going to take it back. I would kind of like to put the equals x on the right hand side. I think it'll just visually look a little bit clearer what I'm doing. Okay? Don't hurt anything, but. Okay, so another way to change this into exponential form. It's what I'm going to call a scorpion tail. We're in Oklahoma. If you haven't seen scorpions thus far, you will at some point. They regularly visit my home. It's not good. My cats think they're just fun, though. They play with them. Okay, so we're going to circle the E, and we're going to draw a curved um, arrow around to land right next to E at the Y. Okay, and this looks like the tail of a scorpion. So I'm going to call it a scorpion's tail. And what this tells you is that if you follow the arrow around, you can rewrite this. E was the base of the log, so E will be the base of the exponential. We cross to the other side, that becomes the exponent of the exponential. And then we land on top of the Y, and so that will equal Y. I really like visual things, and this just appeals to my sense of visual imagery. And so this is the one that I use. But you can use either of those methods you like. So what we're going to be talking about then is these things called exponentials, right? They're going to look like e to the x. And they don't even have to have a base of e. There's another base. You can use other bases as well. We'll talk about other bases you can use. But for this section, we're mostly going to be talking about e. And what we're going to look at then is the properties for exponentials. Okay, again, this is algebra stuff. You've seen it before. So we have a to the m and a to the n. And then we're multiplied, we add their exponents, a to the m plus n. If they're divided, a to the m over a to the n, we subtract the exponents, a to the m minus n. If there's a single base, a, and it looks like it's sort of raised to two powers, right? a to the m and then in parentheses, and it's raised to the n, we multiply those exponents together, m times n. If we have a, um, or if we have two bases, a and b, and they're raised to a power, we have kind of a distributive property going on. It's the same thing as having a to the power and then b to the power. And we do the same thing if we have a rational, right? It's written as a ratio a over b to the power of m. And we can, again, it looks like distribute that power to the numerator and that power to the denominator. All of these can be shown really quickly why they work. Um, it's not really the focus of what we're going to do, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But if you would like to see, like, well, what's the difference between 1 and 3? Why do we want to add 1 and we want to multiply 1? I can show you real quick examples later. 
but I don't want to do it here right now. I just don't think it's worth our time for the, for the bigger picture of what's going on. Okay. So these are exponential properties. So what we're going to be doing first is we're going to be solving exponential equations. Our goal is to figure out what does X equal. Generally, we will find the exact answer first. And then like the directions say here, we will round it to three decimals. Okay. So we're going to find the exact answer and we're going to do the rounded answer both. So the goal, as with any solving of equations, is to get the x, in this case, alone. So we're going to add our 6. So now I have 3e to the x, and it's going to equal 14. But what our next step? Divide by 3. You got it. So this is division by 3. So at this point, I now have e to the x equals 14 over 3. So this is the location where you can either use the scorpion tail, but sort of in reverse. I didn't draw it that way. Or you can drop in logs. I'm going to drop in logs for this one. If we have another opportunity with the scorpion tail later, I'll show you that one too. But if I drop in logs, they have to be natural logs because this is base E that we're working with. And I will put a natural log on both sides. On the left, the natural log and the E cancel out. The X coming down to the front, leaving me with simply X. And on the right hand side, this is the natural log of 14 over three. Now there's no reason to rewrite it, but if you saw it written as natural log of 14 minus natural log of three, that'd be okay, right? It's a property of logs. We could separate it out as a subtraction. I'm not going to, there's no reason to, but it wouldn't be wrong. So this is the exact answer. And then we're going to find an approximate answer. So your calculator will do this just fine for you. Type in natural log of 14 over 3. And we will round to three decimal places. So I have 1.540. And we do write the zero because it's supposed to have three decimal places. So even though it's a zero which doesn't contribute any value, we're going to write it. This is our approximation. Okay, so once again, this is algebra. We're not into anything calculus yet. This is algebra. Let's do one more. So this one turned or solved an exponential equation. This next one is going to solve a logarithmic equation. Um, this is an opportunity I'll, I'll use my uh, scorpion tail for. So I'm going to rewrite to make sure I rethink about this, that this is log base e of 4x is equal to 1. I'm going to circle the base, e, and draw my scorpion tail around to the 4x. Okay, so the scorpion tail always goes to the other side of the equal sign. Whether the equal is on the right or the left, it doesn't even really matter, but it's going to go to the other side. As I rewrite this, this is an e base to the power of 1, and it will equal where I land, which is 4x. Now, e to the 1 is just e. Right, it's about 2.718. It's just the number e. And what would I do to solve for x? Divide by 4. So my exact answer is e over 4. That's the exact value. And then we're going to put e over 4 in the calculator and get an approximation to three decimal places. So mine actually says 0.6795, so that's going to round it up. So I'm going to have 0 0.680 as my approximation. Okay, is that all right? It's like crash course of algebra about exponentials. That's what that was. Now, there's some general shapes. Um, or it is a general shape for exponentials as well. Um, this is going to feel again like what we did with logs. It looks like this. Um, these are the different features that are valuable here. Uh, it has a y-intercept at 0, 1, so I'll mark that. This is at the value of 1 crossing. There is no x-intercept. It has a horizontal asymptote right down here on the x-axis. That's a horizontal asymptote. It's also the equation y equals zero. It increases without bound. 
right? So in, without bound again means that it never stops, right? It's going to continue doing so and it's unbounded. So not just never stops, but it's unbounded. And then the domain is negative infinity to infinity. It's all x values from the left to the right. The range on this though is just the top half of the graph. So the range is that the y values are positive. So my range is zero to infinity. The graph is continuous. Okay, draw it, no problems, no jumps or skips or hops or holes, none of that going on. It is one to one. We've got that additional new feature now. We didn't actually describe it, I don't think, that way when we did logs, but logs were actually one to one as well. We may have, I don't remember, but I don't think we did. Um, and then it's concave up, right? Its concavity is that it opens upward. We're not going to do any examples of what comes next because they look just like what we did when we did logs. But you can take this graph and you can shift it up and down and left and right and you can stretch it out of shape and you can flip it over axes and you flip it. You can do all the same kind of transformations that we did with logs. You can do with all graphs, but this is the one we're talking about, right? You can do all these kinds of transformations. And I want to remind you, when I flip to the next screen, all of those transformations, how they occur. So the first one is just, the first thing here is just the equation. So I have a y equals a times e to the bx plus c plus d. See that the unit is in the exponent and the d is down. All right, so if a is greater than one, right, so if it's a two or seven, it's going to stretch it vertically. If it's between a zero and one, it's going to shrink it. So kind of imagine it's like a spring, right? If you're stretching it, you're pulling it up like this. And because it's bounded on the x-axis, you're not moving that part. You're stretching it up like this, so it's going to make it look taller. And if it's shrinking, it's going to compress it down. Second thing, horizontal stretch. So this B value, it actually works backwards. It's a stretch if the B is between zero and one. So again, what you're going to do now is you're going to like hold on to the sides of the graph. And you're going to take them and you're going to stretch it out this way, like a harmonica. No, that's not the right one. Accordion, right? Accordion. So you're going to take it and you're going to pull it out like this. Okay, that's a stretch. And then if it's a, so it's going to actually look wider if you do that. Um, if it is a value bigger than one, it's going to squish it back together. So it's going to look narrower and thinner and taller when we do that. Notice the imagery that we get when we do a vertical stretch and a horizontal shrink give us the same kind of imagery. Um, so stretching one and shrinking the other actually is the same imagery that comes out to, out to play. But All right, C, if we take um, the C value that's up in that exponent, it will shift it left and right. Negative shifts it right and positive shifts it, shifts it left. Everything occurs backwards if it's occurring when associated with x. And then the d on the end, if it's positive, it goes up, negative, it goes down. Everything on the outside, which is d and a here, happened the way we would expect them to. So I think you're gonna have like a couple to graph um, inside of WebAssign. Your calculator is gonna shift, you know, gonna help, going to assist you with that as well with those shifts and stretches and things. So I don't wanna spend too much time more on the, cal the algebra of this. We're gonna move on to the calculus. Now, here's a cool thing. The derivative of e to the x is the best one that you're gonna ever encounter because its derivative is itself. Its derivative is itself. So think about that. I'm gonna sketch it on this paper, uh, or on the screen, a little bit. Think about why that is the case. When I look at this graph, the y values are positive, correct? Y values are positive. But the graph is also increasing, correct? So when the graph is increasing, it means that the derivative is positive, okay? Well, the derivative here, right, this, this graph is positive, just like its derivative has positive um, values. And it's doing it really slowly at first, right? It's got very small positive values, and it has very small positive slopes. And at the end, right over here on the right-hand side on the far right, it gets to being very big positive y values, and it has very 
big positive slopes. It's very steep. So the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So we're going to take a derivative using that feature of several different functions. Okay, so these log graphs and these log derivatives and these exponential derivatives are on the gateway that's happening next week, okay? So as you look at this one, what property do you see in play here? Somebody said it. Product rule, thank you. It is a product rule, right? These two pieces are being multiplied, so I need to use the product rule. Depending on who you've taken calculus from and how you've done it, you may do it in a different order than I do. That's fine. Um, so we just have to pick one. So I'm going to pick the same one that I usually use, which is that I first just write down the first piece. You can always start it then. But now I need the derivative of e to the negative x. Okay. What's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. So the same thing's true for the e to the negative x. But then I have that negative x, which is an inside function. And what's the derivative of negative x? Negative 1. So I'm going to put the negative 1 there. Feel free to put it in the front. I'll put it there in a minute. Product rule says we're going to add, and now we're going to take the derivative of the component at the beginning, x squared. What is the derivative of x squared? 2x. And then I rewrite the second piece. Okay? The only simplification that's super, like, you should do it kind of thing is to move the negative to the beginning if you didn't write it there already. If you wish to leave it in this form, otherwise you may. If we were asked to find a second derivative, it's not in the most conducive form. So let me just show you what you would do if you wanted to continue on or if you were asked to continue on in this problem. What you would do is you would notice the things that are in common and you'd factor them out. What is in common to both of these pieces? The e to the negative x and the x. Now, it's possible they might leave the x where it is. I'm going to pull it out right here in front. So I've got the x, e to the negative x. Um, I'll leave the negative inside. So this leaves me with a negative x here and a positive 2 here. Now, there's nothing preferable about this notation just for the sake of being you know, the problem in and of itself, but I just want you to be aware that if WebAssign tells you you have an error and then it gives you this as the answer, <laughs> that's why it's done it. It's factored it out. Okay, fine. But if you distribute it back through, you'd have the same thing. Okay? How about this one? What overall rule do you see here? Quotient rule. There's a quotient rule. All right, so quotient rule, I do high over low. And if I take the derivative, I say the following, low d high minus high d low, all over low, low, and away we go. Okay, dashing through the snow or something like that, yeah. Okay, so low, the denominator comes first. That's e to the 2x plus one. Now I need d high, the derivative of what's on top. What is the derivative of the part on top? e to the 2x times 2, because I need the derivative of the exponent. Perfect. Uh, that is half of my numerator. Then I'm going to subtract, and I do it in the opposite order. So now I need low, uh, I'm sorry, high, which is e to the 2x, d low, so the derivative of the denominator. So what is the derivative of the denominator here? e to the 2x times two. times 2. It happens to be the same, right? Of course, that's just not going to always happen, but it did here. And all of this is over the denominator squared. Okay, are we good? Let me just tell you real quick, we do not want to square the denominator. We're going to leave it just like that. That is not going to be a helpful thing you're going to do, so you're not going to try and do that at all. But we do want to clean up the numerator. There are some pieces there that will simplify. So I'm going to distribute this through here. So the 2 will come to the front. What happens if I multiply e to the 2x times e to the 2x? Nope. e to the 4x. So this is one of those properties of logs, uh, sorry, exponents that we did on the front page, right? I have to add the exponents together. So this will be e to the 4x. 
and then I have plus 2e to the 2x from the other piece. On the second one, I'm going to distribute this one. In fact, I'm not distributing at all. There's no addition and subtraction. I take it back. I'm just going to multiply. I'm going to get a 2. And then e to the 2x times e to the 2x, we said was e to the 4x. So we have this. OK, what do you notice happens on top? There's a positive and a negative of this one, and they so they cancel each other out. They add to zero. That's very friendly. Again, doesn't always happen, but we'll a lot of times uh, see some cancellations somehow or some combinations of things. So this is 2e to the 2x over e to the 2x plus 1 squared. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, we're going to take the second derivative of 1 because I wanted to show you that whole why would we want to simplify it in this funny way kind of thing going on. So <clears throat> first we're going to take a derivative in order to get to the second derivative. So this is again a product rule. Um, you could distribute it first, but you're still going to end up with a product rule even if you do. So I'm going to leave it as is and take the product rule as is which means the first piece just gets rewritten, 3 plus 2x. What's the derivative of e to the negative 3x? Yep, times negative 3, right? I'll move it to the front in a minute. And then we're going to add to this the derivative of the first piece. So what's the derivative of 3 plus 2x? 2. And then we just have the second piece, e to the negative 3x. So we're going to clean this up. We're going to see what we have. Um, I am going to distribute this piece through here. So I have negative 9 e to the negative 3x. Uh, minus 6xe to the negative 3x. And then there's still a plus 2e to the negative 3x over here. Now, sometimes at this point you can combine some things, but if you notice, you can't combine these. They do all have something in common, but they have variables not in common as well. So this is the point where you would be done if you were just asked to find the first derivative. But we're asked to find the second and if I find the second derivative from here, I have to do a product rule right here, and I have to do a product rule. Oops. Yeah, I have to do a product rule right there. That would be, that would be it on this one. Okay? So I'm going to show you another way to do that, mentioning what I did before. We're going to pull out the e to the negative 3x that they have in common and isolate what remains. So there's a negative 9. There's a negative 6x. Do I have two of them to combine? Oh, I didn't notice it before. I apologize, truly, plus two. Um, these ones would have combined. I'm so sorry. We could have combined them a step before. We can combine them now. It's okay. Um, we can combine them here because I have negative nine and have positive two. That's fine. So I have e to the negative three x, and then I have negative seven minus six x. Eh. All right. We're going to find a second derivative from here. I don't have space, but I'll make it smaller if I need to. So the second derivative, I rewrite the first piece. What's the derivative of negative 7 plus, uh, minus 6x? Minus 6. And then I have the first piece. I've got addition. And I'm going to take the derivative of the first piece. So the derivative of e to the negative 3x is... Right? And I rewrite the second piece. Negative 7 minus 6x. Okay, we'll clean this up, simplify what we can. Um, I've got negative 6e to the negative 3x. Um, this piece right here, this negative 3e to the negative 3x, will distribute through here. So negative 3 and negative 7 would be positive 21 e to the negative 3x. And then, 
sorry, not positive. Yeah, positive, yes. And then I've got another positive. So positive 18 x e to the negative 3x. And then we can combine a couple things, which is what we should have noticed the last time and I didn't. Um, these first two pieces can combine because they're the same except for the coefficients. So I have negative 6 and positive 21, which gives me 15 e to the negative 3x plus 18 x e to the negative 3x. And you could factor something out if you wanted to. There's no reason to at this point. This is perfectly fine. All right. Last thing in our section is derivatives Antiderivative, derivative is, excuse me. So if the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, then the antiderivative of e to the x is also e to the x eh, plus c, right? Shift it up and down. Got that. Plus c. So it's its own derivative and antiderivative. He is the friendliest one you have, without question. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to find a couple of indefinite integrals and then a definite integral. So indefinite integrals, if you take a look at this, this is not exactly e to the x, it's e to something. What do you suppose we're going to do with that something? A u substitution. So the u, because this is really our only tool, right? Don't have very many of them. We've got some trig substitutions, some u substitutions, and some, some simplifying with some algebra maybe, but that's about it. What is the derivative of one minus three x? Yes. Yeah. Got it? Okay, derivative? Negative 3 dx. Very good. Cool. Uh, I don't have a negative 3 in my problem, so I simply divide it to the other side, right? Just like what we were doing last time. So we're going to have a negative 1 third over here. We're going to have an e to the u, and then the dx is going to be replaced by du and the negative 1 third at the beginning. Negative 1 third comes along for the ride. What's the antiderivative of e to the u? e to the u. And plus C. And the last step is to do the replacement with the 1 minus 3x in for, for the u. And we're done. Straightforward enough. Okay, next one's not. Look at that. Lots of E's. It's from addition to subtraction. Okay. We really only have one tool though, and it's called U substitution. And when there's division in a problem like this, the U substitution has to be the denominator, right? So that's where we're going to start. We don't know if it's going to work, but this is the only thing we have to try is to let the entire denominator be U. So then, what is the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. What's the derivative? I've got the negative in there. What's the derivative of e to the negative x? e to the negative x times negative 1 dx. Notice these cancel, right? Minus the negative there. So I'll rewrite it. du is e to the x plus e to the x. What do you notice? That's the top, right? Just like that. The problem is so much easier. So I can actually replace all of this right here with du. The denominator is what I let u be and one on top. Okay. What's the antiderivative of one over u? Natural log of the absolute value of u plus c, right? And we back substitute our u back in, which was funny looking, that's okay. e to the x minus e to the negative x plus c. And there is no way to simplify the interior and like separate them out because it's addition and subtraction inside. 
Okay, I think I have just enough time to finish our last one. You ready? Hold on tight. Okay, definite integral. They work the same way, right? You just have the extra step at the end where we do some substitutions back in with numbers. So this looks like multiplication, agree? Yes, there is no product rule, however, for antiderivatives. So again, you use the only tool you have, which is otherwise known as u substitution. We're gonna use u substitution. And the u needs to be what appears to be in parentheses. So what appears to be in parentheses here? It's hard to get the program to write it the way I want. Can you tell? Yeah, the exponent right here is supposed to look like it's in the exponent position. It just, there's limitations, unfortunately, but this is what we have. So it's negative x squared over two. What is the derivative of negative x squared over two? Train slowing down. You guys can do this. Come on. Negative x. Thank you. So the two comes down. It's going to cancel with the two in the denominator. This is derivatives, right? Two comes down. Going to cancel with two in the denominator. I still have the x and I still have the negative dx. Do you see that in our problem? Almost, right? We have an x and a dx. So we simply need this negative to move to the other side. So the negative will be out here in front. Do not write your limits of integration because we're changing them into u's. This will be e to the u. Now then, what's the antiderivative of e to the u? e to the u, negative still in front, plus a c. We'll back substitute for u. So this is e to the negative x squared over two. Oh, I don't need my plus c's. I take it back because we're doing definite integrals. We'll take that off. And we're letting our limits of integration go from two to square root, I'm sorry, from zero to square root of two. So I have negative e to the negative square root of two squared over two. And then I have minus negative e to the zero. Got a lot of negatives here. Here's these two negatives are gonna cancel. I promise we're almost done. The square root of two squared is two. Two divided by two is one. There's a negative up there, so this is e to the negative one. e to the zero is one, because anything to the zero power is one. And you can leave it like this if you wish, but normally people don't. They would write it as negative one over e, and they'd move that e down into the denominator to avoid negative exponents. We could, of course, get a um, decimal approximation if asked for this as well, correct? Absolutely. Very good.